귀빈 여러분 안녕하십니까? 귀빈 여러분 안녕하십니까? I'd like to sincerely welcome the first, the KCGF International Conference. I am the announcer, Chang Yejin. Nice to meet you all today. It's also a very great honor to be the MC for today's international conference due to the weather conditions. And I sincerely ask all the, the participants and I would like to express the gratitude to all of your participations. And this is the sponsored by the Happy Nera as well as the Flashman Hillet Korea. And we are here to explore the future directions of ESG development in Korea. Furthermore, today's program will be also live streamed via the Hangopo, which is the KCGF TV as well. Let me announce briefly about the progress of the today's event. The KCGF, we are going to listen to the open remarks by the chairman of the National the Policy Committee, as well as the chairman of the KCGF, as well as the congratulatory remarks from the chairman of the Financial Services Commission. We are also going to take also the keynote speech, as well as the panel discussions, followed by the photograph as well. And then we will also have the coffee break and the meal time together. So please stay with us until the end of the today's program. And let us now start the today's event. First of all, let me introduce the this guest and all of when your name is called out and then please stand up and then the participant can also to give a very warm welcome a round of applause we also have the chairman of the national policy committee of the national assembly yun kwan so let's welcome him with a big round of applause and we also have e yongu the national assembly of the 21st session of the national assembly next they probably let me also speed up introducing about the pers participants. We have the Ryong, the chairman of the Korea Corporate Governance Forum, KCGF. We have Shin Young Won, the policy, the chairman of the National Pension Fund, the NPS. We have Sa Won Ju, the chief. Ha Youngju, Chief of the National the Insurance Corporation. We have Yi Changju, the CEO of the Xinan Asset Corporation. We have So Yusok, CEO of the Mira Asset Operating Company. We have Inamu, Professor of Graduate School of International Studies of Yonsei University. We have Kim Hyogun. The Dean of the International Studies of Ewa Women University of Korea. And last, we also have Park Dae Yang, the CIO of the KIC, Korea Investment Corporation, Park Dae Yang. And furthermore, we also have additional the participants, but due to time constraints, please apologize me not to introduce all the distant guests today. Then let us start the today's event with the re open remarks of the chairman of the KCGF, Liu Yongjie. Liu Yongjie, the chairman, was also one of the policy advisors for the former president of Korea, and he is also the CEO of the Sustainable Investment the Corporation, so we're taking a lot of roles. Let's welcome him with a round of applause. Distinguished guests, good evening. I am Liu Yongjie, chairman of C KCGF. First of all, I would like to thank you for attending the first international conference of our forum out of your busy schedule. So thank you very much. At the same time, I would also like to thank those who are watching the event through YouTube channel. At the venue today, many distinguished guests are participating. First of all, I would also like to thank Honorable Chairman of the National Policy Committee of the Republic of Korea, Mr. Yoon Kwan Seok, and Chairman of the Financial Services Commission, Mr. Eun Song Soo, who sent a video greeting message. Thank you all. There are more special guests to whom I want to express my sincere gratitude to, but due to the restraint in time, I would like to, I would not introduce all the participants. The world's best experts in the field of ESG and corporate governance will take the initiative in the presentations and panel discussions for today's event. Kerry Waring, the CEO of ICGN, 
Hiro Mizuno, the UN Special Envoy, who also had worked as a CIO of GPI. F of Japan, which is the world's largest public pension fund, will deliver presentations. Mr. Park Dae-yang, CIO of Korea Investment Corporation, Johanna Kirkland, the group CIO of Schroeder, Michael Jantz from Sustainalytics, the world's largest ESG rating firm, will participate in the panel discussion moderated by Professor Inamu. I would also like to thank all the participants. I've been in the ESG and responsible investment field for nearly two decades, and I regard today's event very timely and significant. As you are well aware, recently in Korea, ESG has been the biggest and hottest topic. The global search volume for the term ESG has increased by four times over the last three years. However, in Korea, compared to the media coverage on the ESG from 2011 to 2019, the volume was increased by as high as 15 times last year. In the first quarter of this year only, the media coverage surpassed that of last year. This shows that Korea pays attention to ESG. However, we must bear in mind that it is difficult to secure the sustainability of this trend. Now is the time to convert the ESG trend into a sustainable tide so that the investment culture and corporate order would be innovated in an ESG-friendly way. I am firmly convinced that the ESG investment of the public pensions will mark the starting point. It is because the ESG investment requires long-termism, and in Korea, only the public pension funds are the investors who can make long-term investments in terms of the fund structure. Therefore, against this backdrop, I am convinced that the industry and companies of Korea will innovate themselves in ESG-friendly way. When the public pension funds are not obsessed with the short-term performance and sustain, sustain the long-term ESG investment, supplying funds for the companies and the industries. Second, for sustainable development of Korea's ESG, the ESG ecosystem must be advanced together as you know, the ESG industry ecosystem has asset owners, asset managers, and service providers. The asset owner must be very meticulous in managing not only quantitative expansion, but also qualitative level of the ESG mandates. Then various approaches of ESG research analysis and strategy will be developed and the ESG investment in true meaning, not the ESG washing, will be realized. It does not make sense to expect outcome without investment and management for the ESG ecosystem. Lastly, in Korea, Digital New Deal, Green New Deal, and Human New Deal are the hot topics. The three types of New Deal and the ESG investment are very similar in terms of objectives and approaches. If Korea's public pension funds take the lead in the implementing the ESG investment, this will give a momentum for the Korean government's New Deal. Therefore, the government does not need to make a new terms of New Deal finance or New Deal fund through the ESG finance and ESG investments that are already universally global globally used, the Korean government will effectively realize the paradigm shift towards the human-centered economy, green energy transition, and digital transition. Under the circumstances, the large-scale ESG funds of the world will create a rush into the capital market of Korea, supporting the Korean economy. This marks the end of my greeting message. I hope today's event will be meaningful for all of you to le learn a lesson from the experts from all over the world. Thank you again. Thank you all.
Mr. Yoon kwan -sok has been a policymaker from the 19th National Assembly, and nowadays he is working as a committee head of the uh, Democratic Party of Korea. I am the chairman of the National Policy Committee, Yoon kwan -sok, and I sincerely celebrate the second international conference of the KCGF this year. And then I also heard that, that this event is also joined by a lot of the distinct guests and experts in the field and really see that the rapid the supply of the vaccinations across the region in Korea. But taking this opportunity, I'd like to also express a gratitude to the host as well as all the staff members for preparing this event. And I also like to extend my gratitude to all the people who have honored this event. First of all, on behalf of the National Policy Committee, not only for the ESG, but also the policy actions have also done by the Yongu as well. And now we are also seeing that the spread of the vaccinations as well as the pandemic and as the concept, the capitalism 4.0 as the concept by the Anatol Kaleski as back into 2011, we have seen the rapid growth so far. During the 1990s and the 2000s, the neoliberalism was the one of the very, the, the awakening, the call. And then since the global financial crisis the back in 2008, we have also seen that the more increasing importance of the environment and community spirit, as well as the corporate decision makings as form of the discourses and practices. Therefore, the COVID pandemic has been reaffirming the important values of the human-centered, the capitalism as well. And at this cr critical juncture, now we have seen that the national power across the regions and the national borders in the midst of the globalization. We have also reaffirmed that all the countries around the world have played their critical roles along with the societies as well as the citizens and the governments. Therefore, as also mentioned by the previous speaker, the ESG has been also highly interested and in mentioned across the regions as well. So along with the progressive commercialism as well as the greenwashing, would also have some of the controversies, but now we see that the ESG, as well as the, all the important the values, are seeing and uh, taking a lot of attention along with the, a lot of the implications. And now we also see that the, one of the very frequent the, the concept uh, in Korea we have seen is, is the asynchronism and the synchronism of asynchronism. Therefore, across all the times, we have also seen that all the conflicts and the imbalances between the traditional and the modern values. And we also see that the Korea is also one of the countries who has also shown the more the proactive, the patterns, rather than just the follower in the past in the field of the leading capitalism. But nowadays, as we also check the COVID-19, we see that we have also narrowed the gap between Korea and other leading countries. As we have also checked the G7 summit in fields of the PPP, the private public partnerships, as well as the public order, the Korea has been mentioned a lot of the modern examples to show that such a very this the strengthens is especially in the field of the quarantine and the disinfection. Therefore, rather than just playing a the follower, but as a proactive country, we have also seen that the Korea has not only accumulated the human capitals, but also to put the more priorities, how to end it, how to make good use of such the capital, human capitals within the country. And so far, we have also seen a lot of the conflicts and the issues, especially the rights of by the working environments and the laborers. We also see that the more risk factors are um, the stem stemming from the corporate the structures by the large companies. Therefore, the ES. ESG discourses and the systems are the ones that we can also really heal and improve improve the reality of the our economy. Therefore, I really look forward to taking a lot of the insights and opinions to really solve those issues by a lot of the ex experts from home and abroad. Therefore, uh, on behalf of the chairman of the National Policy Committee, we really like to also put more energy and efforts and are fully committed to really taking a lot of the active roles and responsibilities for the ESG as well as related policies and the law. I have also personally participated in the related 
the seminars and the lectures in the fields of ESG. And I'm really looking forward to taking the more intentions and interest, especially from the National Assembly as well. Related also, the bills have been also proposed by the National Assembly on the ESG. Once again, a sincerely welcome and all of you and celebrate the today's event. Thank you. Thank you very much for your good remarks. Next, we're going to invite Lee Young Woo, the 21st session National Assembly of Republic of Korea. He's also working as a policy advisor and also the senior, the vice director of the National Assembly. Let's welcome him with a big round of applause. Good afternoon, good evening. I am Lee Young Woo. Uh, first of all, I must confess that I have been in touching with the market. I have a lot of experiences in the market. I'm really proud of the, my experiences. And on the process, I especially realized that there are some blind points that the government does not really know. So the efficiency and effectiveness of the nature of market has been a lot of times winked at, and I was really sorry for that. And the importance of the ESG has been quite ignored. So about a few days ago, the ministry announced that it should be standardized. However, that, that should never be done because the concept of ESG is creating a new ecosystem from the market and investment indexes and indicators. There are a lot of uh, features that's in the ecosystem for the investment and all the players in the market have their own functions. And in the natural process, a rule could be naturally born. So I'd like to say that S&P, Moody's and Peach can have different ratings and scores and, and we don't need to standardize the different scores and that's just, should be done by the invisible hands. And by doing so, a specialized feature could be born. At the same time, the concept of ESG and other things, according to Rebecca Anderson and other specialists, what's really important is a paradigm shift that we must realize for ESG. However, under the base of the ESG is that the stakeholders must be treated well in the governance. So this is the reason that we must realize the foundation or the paradigm of the governance. And given the Korean capital market and the rules and regulations over the listed companies needs a lot of improvements. And this is the point that I am really interested in. As Mr. Yu young mentioned before, when we talk about New Deal, what's really important is that the market must evaluate and assess the concept. And then the market will create a new trend and market will yield some outcome. That's what we call the ecosystem. We must lay the groundwork for the New Deal ecosystem. So we must think about the linkage between New Deal fund and New Deal projects. So we must be assured that the actual investment should be realized. That's why we can uh, kick off the approach of methodology so that the market itself would be assessed in an accurate way. From this perspective, I think today's event is really timely and meaningful. And recently, a lot of people have been talking about the ESG. However, what's more important is to realize so in the market, based on the indicators of the market, we must see the actual performance from the investment. So we must assess and analyze the performance from the investment. By doing so, I'm quite convinced that climate change and net zero or carbon neutrality would be realized and implemented. That's what I'm really deeply interested in and I'm trying to make it a policy. Thank you for listening. 
Thank you, Mr. Yung Wu. And lastly, let's invite Mr. Eun Song Su, the Chairman of the Financial Services Commission. Mr. Eun Song Su, who has been worked for the Changhua Day under the presidential office and who has been really active in laying the groundwork for financial policies of Korea. As of now, he's the head of the Financial Services Commission, but unfortunately, he cannot attend today's. A meeting, so he delivered his video message. Let's take a look. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and good evening. I am Eun Sung Soo, the chairman of the Financial Services Commission. Last month, the G P4G so summit was successfully held. Recently, the discussions on the response to climate changes have been emerging, and at the same time, ESG is a global topic. I would like to thank Mr. Yu Youngjae of KCGF and staff for organizing this meaningful and significant forum. I would also like to thank Yoon Kwan Seok of the National Policy Committee and other distinguished guests for attending today's event. In 2017, when I was the chairman for KIC, the company introduced the stewardship code and announced the plan for expanding the ESG investment. At that time, people raised the voices of concern over the potential burden to companies. Although most investment from the KEIC was made into foreign companies, people resisted against the new system. However, the trend has changed in only four years. The media, the academia, and the civic groups highlight the importance of irresponsible investment and ESG. ESG is never a short-term trend. It is an important topic that we must sustain. To this end, we need to make sustainable efforts. First and foremost, companies and corporate investors should actively participate in the trend. When it is widespread to various stakeholders, relevant information and data would be sufficiently accumulated, then the market credibility on ESG will be established. At the same time, it is equally important to respond to the international discussions. While closely watching the discussions and trend of the international organizations and advanced countries, we must actively express our opinions and work closely with rel related organizations. The government will support what strong will. In the end of last year, the Korean government established the plan for implementing carbon neutrality. And this year, the autonomous disclosure of the sustainable management report for the Cospi listed firms will be introduced. From 2030, all Cospi listed firms should disclose the ESG information. Lastly, in order to make ESG firmly rooted in society, all participants in the capital market must collectively think and make efforts. I hope today's event will serve as an opportunity to discuss the ESG development of Korea. Thank you. Thank you for your message, Mr. Eun Song Su. Now, prior to the main session of today's event, which will be delivered in English, please use your interpretation receiver on your table. Channel one is for Korean, channel two is for English. So upon your necessity, please use the receiver on the table. And let's invite Professor Inamu, who will be the moderator for today's session. He's a guest visitor professor at Yonsei University and is the board member of the Korean Governance Committee. Let's give him a big round of hands. Thank you, Ms. Chang, for having the first uh, session. Uh, good evening. Good morning, London. Very early morning, Toronto. On behalf of Korea Corporate Governance Forum, I would like to welcome all of you to inaugural conference on ESG. My name is Namari. I'm moderator for uh, today's event. Uh, the topic of today's uh, session is exploring the future directions of ESG development in Korea. Okay, so. We have two uh, distinguished um, keynote speakers. Uh, first, we're going to listen to Carrie Waring. She is Chief Executive of um, 
uh, ICGN, and she's going to talk for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we're going to move on to Tokyo uh, to listen to Hiro Mizuno. I'm, I'm sure that a lot of you are familiar with him. He's currently UN Special Envoy on Innovative Finance and Sustainable Investment. After listening to uh, two uh, speakers, we will have a panel discussion where Hero will join uh, together with Michael Jansi. He's the uh, currently CEO of Sustainalytics. He's calling in from Toronto. So he's very early in to uh, Toronto there. We have Johanna Kirkland. She's the Group Chief Investment Officer at Schroeder. She's calling in from London. And finally, we have Mr. Pak Yang, uh, David Park, who is Chief Investment Officer of KIC. So we'll have a four a panelists in the second half uh, session. So let's just kick off with um, keynote speaker from London, uh, uh, Carrie. Hi, good morning. Hello. Thank you very much for inviting me to the first KCGF International Conference. Uh, I mean, Liu Yongjae is a longtime friend of ICGN and uh, KCGF is indeed a long standing member and hosted the annual conference in Seoul in 2008, for which I have very fond memories. So thank you all so much. I think at that time we were grappling with the worst global financial crisis ever experienced. Today, we face arguably an even more challenging situation, uh, a double jeopardy, if you like, of the COVID pandemic and climate change. Uh, both have exposed stark social inequalities and public mistrust in capitalism propagated like never before. So how companies and investors address these systemic risks while leveling up across society is key to successfully rebooting the global economy, while at the same time creating a healthier uh, and more sustainable world. Um, for those of you who may not know, uh, ICGN, we were established 25 years ago by some of the world's largest pension funds uh, to promote high standards of corporate governance, supporting long-term value creation, contributing to healthy and sustainable economy, society and, and the environment. And our work program is led by investors responsible for assets uh, in excess of $59 trillion, based mainly in Europe and North America, but with growing Asia representation, including uh, KIC, NPS, uh, GPIF, Sustinvest, and, and many, many more. Today, I've been asked to share my observations with you on the evolution of corporate governance and how our priorities have changed, uh, really from an initial focus on the what I might call the financial aspects of corporate value over 30 years ago, to a more holistic understanding today of the importance of the human capital and the natural capital drivers that have a significant impact over a company's sustainable long-term value creation. And I'd really like to explain this through the lens of the ICGN Global Governance Principles, and you can see the slide on screen, uh, which have been updated this year as part of a three-year review cycle published over 20 years ago, many ICGN members default to the ICGN principles really as a bellwether for their own voting policies and company engagements. And indeed, many governments uh, rely on the ICGN principles to help inspire the evolution of national codes. Um, I should add that I also have the privilege of serving on the Council of Experts convened by the Financial Services Agency and the Tokyo Stock Exchange to advise on the review of Japan's Code of Corporate Governance published just last month. So I'll draw on some of my experience in my remarks. I note that the Code of Best Practice for Corporate Governance uh, here in Korea was updated, I think it says 2016, and I therefore hope that I might encourage you to consider reviewing and updating the Code uh, in due course. So fundamentally, corporate governance is the system by which companies are directed and controlled based on the principles of fairness, accountability, responsibility, and transparency. Boards are responsible for promoting the long-term success and resilience of companies through effective governance, managerial oversight, 
strategic direction and reporting. Investors are responsible for holding boards to account for these actions on behalf of their beneficiaries through the exercise of shareholder rights and responsibilities. And this includes company monitoring, voting, engagement, and also reporting. Today, we appreciate that companies and investors have a mutual responsibility to preserve and enhance long-term corporate value. And in doing so, they really must focus not only on aspects relating to a company's long-term financial value, but also on factors impacting the health of society and the environment too. So in essence, this is about the governance of sustainability and the role of the board in overseeing the integration of human and natural capital management in alignment with the company's purpose and long-term strategy. So it's really against this backdrop that the ICGN global governance principles have been revised and there are literally dozens of changes uh, this year based on feedback from ICGN members reflecting their own current market practice, but also in alignment with regulatory changes around the world. So while there are probably too many changes for me to reflect within our limited time today, I'd like to introduce you to some of the key changes. And I think I'd like to do this in three parts. Firstly, as on the slide, you can see in respect to the changes of what you might call traditional corporate governance principles. Secondly, in relation to how the principles take account of sustainability related concepts. And thirdly, in relation to an entirely new section on AGMs, which really uh, has been enhanced in response to COVID restrictions and the impact on shareholder rights. So in terms of the key corporate governance changes, from the outset, we've emphasized the importance of independent board leadership and a clear division of responsibilities between the role of the chair and the CEO to avoid unfettered powers of decision making. We also think that the roles of both should be clearly described and publicly disclosed, as well as a description of what the role of the lead independent director might be. We've strengthened our standard for a majority of independent directors on the board and not just in companies with widely held share ownership structures, but also for those with concentrated share ownership sub structures and subsidiaries. Uh, board diversity guidance has been expanded to encourage effective, equitable and inclusive decision making across not only the board, but the workforce in alignment with the company's purpose and key stakeholders. And this year we've separated out a specific guidance for gender diversity with a preference for at least one third of board positions to be held by women. And I know positively last year's introduction in Korea of the legal requirement for a female director on corporate boards, which we welcome. We emphasize the importance of conducting board evaluation annually to review composition in alignment with the company's long-term strategy, succession planning and diversity policy. And we maintain the importance of also having an external board evaluation once every three years. Reference to board tenure has been enhanced to clarify that term limits where they exist and the identity of directors who have exceeded those limits and thus are no longer considered to be independent should be disclosed. More generally, we believe that director re-election should be contingent on a satisfactory performance of his or her contribution to the board. There should be a formal and transparent approach to board director appointments based on relevant and objective selection criteria led by an independent nomination committee to ensure appropriate board refreshment aligned with the company's long-term strategy, succession planning and diversity policy. Uh, there's also new guidance on capital allocation to manage competing company, investor and stakeholder interests while maintaining sufficient liquidity, of course, to ensure resilience. We have acknowledged public debate around tax avoidance by emphasising the board's role in overseeing a company's tax policy and not only within a legal context, uh, but within the bounds of acceptable social norms. On risk, we have added that board oversight should include threats to the company's business model, cyber security, supply chain resilience, performance, solvency, liquidity, and of course, reputation. 
And finally, uh, in relation to audit, the work of the audit committee should be explained in the annual report. There should be engagement with shareholders on any significant issues arising from the audit relating to the financial statements and how they were addressed. Additionally, shareholders will want to know about the effectiveness of the audit process generally, including audit tender, tenure, independence fees, and any non-audit services. Can I have the next slide, please? So just moving on to some of the key changes relating to sustainability. Firstly, from the outset, we clarify that the, the, the need for the board to publicly disclose a company purpose to guide management's approach to strategy, innovation and risk, and to really help clarify and identify a company's key stakeholders. Stakeholders are referenced throughout with a focus on identifying who they are, disclosing how their interests are taken into account and how a board engages with stakeholders. Directors' duties clarify responsibility to promote the success of the company, to preserve and enhance share value, while also contributing to a sustainable economy, society and environment. Risk oversight has been expanded to what you might call systemic events, including ecological degradation, social inequality and digital transformation. There's new reference to human capital management, including workforce recruitment, retention, training and succession planning linked to strategy. Human rights, including modern slavery and workforce safety, focus on how companies identify and mitigate risk in their operations and supply chain. We have referenced climate change and the board's role in assessing business impacts and how it will be adapted to meet the needs of a net zero economy by reducing carbon emissions over a specified period. Remuneration guidance emphasizes that plans should be designed to align the interests of the CEO fairly and effectively across the workforce and long-term company strategy, including the use of sustainability related metrics. We have new reference to double materiality for reporting on a company's external impacts on society and the environment, as well as internal impacts on the company's own financial performance. We also refer to the concept of dynamic materiality, recognising that materiality evolves over time alongside things like emerging technologies, innovations and regulation. And finally, we encourage companies to use sustainability related accounting and reporting frameworks. This helps to facilitate consistency and comparability and to contribute to the global consolidation of standards. And we continue to welcome the changes imminently in Korea in 2030 for reporting to be made mandatory uh, and would encourage you if possible to bring that forward. Could I have the next slide please? So finally and primarily instigated by the COVID crisis we've added a new section 10 to the ICGM principles to emphasize the importance of shareholder participation at annual general meetings. And we appreciate, of course, the many reforms to AGMs in Korea over the last few years. There are five new guidelines under Section 10 around ensuring AGMs are efficiently, democratically and securely facilitated to enable constructive interactivity between shareholders and the board. This underscores the board's accountability to shareholders for the company's long term strategy, performance and approach to sustainable value creation. Before I explain these to you, I would just like to emphasize a long held ICGM principle around the equitable treatment of shareholders, which I'm afraid we fear is in regression in some markets and potentially here in Korea. Specifically, this relates to the proposals to allow companies with dual class shares to list on COSTAC. These structures have the potential for managerial entrenchment by virtue of disproportionate control relative to voting rights and economic interest. This is particularly acute when there are decisions on transactions that affect the interests of minority investors in the country. In fact, we canvassed ICGN member opinion on how dual class shares may impact investor decision making a few years ago. 
67% of respondents said that they would apply a greater discount rate to stock valuations or expect higher returns to offset increased risk. And 82% said they expect strong measures in place to mitigate abuses associated with dual class shares, such as board independence, conflicts of interest policies, voting exemptions from major transactions by controlling owners, and sunset clauses, let's say five years from the IPO date. And I mention this in the spirit of maintaining the momentum of positive corporate governance reform in Korea and to avoid any inadvertent steps backwards. But reflecting back on changes to the ICGM principle in relation to annual general meetings, firstly, the meeting format should allow for the physical presence of shareholders and ensure live interaction as possible with the board. Hybrid formats are encouraged, though we discourage audio only meetings which don't allow for adequate shareholder interaction and board accountability. Secondly, companies should establish secure and efficient procedures to enable verification of shareholder identification and the level of shareholding and ensure that all participants can vote on matters submitted to the meeting. Third, companies should publish meeting procedures alongside the AGM notice at least one month in advance. This should include information on the meeting format, registration, shareholder ID and holding, voting options and approach to asking and answering questions. And shareholder questions should be permitted in advance or during the meeting and companies should facilitate unmoderated, transparent and interactive dialogue. The meeting minutes should include the questions and answered and be recorded and made available to all shareholders in the company promptly after the meeting. And finally, on voting results, they should be published promptly on the company website after the meeting. If a board endorsed resolution has been opposed by a significant proportion of votes, let's say 20% or more, the company should explain what actions were taken to understand and to respond to shareholder concerns soon after the meeting. At the following AGM, the board should report how the views from shareholders were considered and actions taken. So to conclude, the proper governance of sustainability is really no longer a nice to have. It is a must have. It's incumbent on companies to create value, not only for shareholders, but for all stakeholders, employing their resources into actively addressing social and environmental risks and opportunities now and into the future. And investors must act as guardians of good governance through the power of share ownership and responsible stewardship practices. Really, as business leaders and institutional investors in positions of influence, we share a common imperative as laid out in the UN Sustainable Development Goals to end poverty, protect the planet and ensure prosperity for all. This is a collective global ambition which we must all share and act upon to help ensure that future generations benefit from long-term economic prosperity, social inclusiveness, and a healthy environment. I hope, in fact, that this can be the theme for ICGN's next conference in Korea, when we convene again in Seoul in 2022, hosted by our friends KCGF and KRX. So I hope to see you in person at that time. On that note, I would like to thank you again for inviting me to this very prestigious event, and I wish you a very successful conference. Thank you very, very much. Goodbye. Um, thank you. Uh, um, Charlie in England, and uh, appreciate you mentioning about female non-executive uh, director. In this room, we have uh, Miss Imira, who was recently appointed to the board of uh, Hanguk Tire. So uh, she completed uh, the uh, female non-executive uh, program offered by. Iwa Women's University Business School. So we have a you know, great momentum around having more female executive on the board of a listed Korean companies. I'm sure you have a lot of questions, but let's wait until we listen to um, Miro, Hiro Mizuno, who is currently um, UN Special Envoy and 
uh, you probably heard about his name because he has uh, he was chief investment officer at Japan's GPIF for five years, and also he sits on the board of a Tesla electric vehicle maker in the U.S. So we're we'll gonna have a Mizuno san from Tokyo. Yes. Can you hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you very well. Good. Well, first of all, uh, it is my real honor to be uh, invited to this the, uh, the Korean Corporate Governance Forum uh, to share some of my experience and uh, my views on what's going on in the area of uh, uh, ESG investments and also the other uh, corporate governance. Uh, I had a lot of uh, uh, opportunities to uh, speak at the uh, the conferences in Korea when I was GPIF CIO, uh, focusing on the uh, topics like uh, gender diversities, and also the I discussed about the um, uh, climate change at that time. So uh, I have a long history of uh, working with the uh, Korean institutions, and uh, I really miss my visit to Korea uh, because I used to visit Korea every other month, but uh, since pandemic, I never had a chance. So I'm really hoping that the, uh, the, uh, we will overcome uh, this uh, difficult situation and we'll be able to travel uh, you know, between uh, two countries very soon. So when I left the GPIF, um, I left with uh, some sense of the um, uh, sort of like a, a sense of achievement because the uh, five years ago, uh, well, actually six years ago, when uh, I decided to put the, uh, the ESG in the center of the uh, or center of the uh, the GPIF, the uh, portfolio management activities and also stewardship activity, uh, the ESG was still sort of a uh, concept uh, being debated. And uh, I joined the uh, GPF, joined the PRI, UN PRI Principal for Responsible Investment uh, during the uh, first six months of my tenure at the GPIF. But at that time, uh, only the excuse we had to join the uh, PRI was not to actually, uh, you know, left behind as there seems to be a big uh, movement in particularly in Europe trying to promote ESG or responsible investment because at that time um, majority of the uh, the people in GPIF as well as the uh, the asset management industry and also the government who supervised the uh, the public pension funds were very very skeptical about ESG as a financially material or financially relevant information. So they just thought it's more like an environmental social activism, and that they are very afraid of GPF becoming a socially uh, active investors or like, you know, the environmentally active uh, investors. But the uh, over the last five years, uh, things, um, well, at the first three years, things changed very slowly. And uh, during that time, I had a memory of being invited by uh, ICGN to uh, give a keynote speech where I was stage interviewed by Kerry. Uh, and uh, I actually questioned them like, because at that time, ICGN seems to be focusing on how to make the, uh, the company more profitable, how to make sure that the, uh, the, uh, the corporate board uh, keep an eye on the, uh, the executive not to do a wrong things. It's basically focusing on the uh, financial results. So uh, my question at that time was, you know, what's the purpose of a corporate governance if you don't invest in that company? Or, you know, if you are, you know, long-term investors, why the uh, corporate governance discussion is, is only about the uh, sort of financial bottom line, but the long-term sustainability of the business or the value the company is uh, providing to the society. And then, after that, um, I actually saw the drastic progress in the, uh, the ICGN like a principle. And I was very, very impressed and very, very happy to see that the, uh, uh, here uh, carries like a speech uh, describing now the, uh, the ICGN, the principle corporate governance is basically uh, kind of pretty much redesigned just to make sure the corporate governance to promote those uh, sustainability agenda 
which is usually listed as uh, one of uh, ESG factors. So I think the, uh, you know, the one uh, observing the uh, development of the corporate governance principle at the ICGS is just uh, is a good evidence that the, uh, the that kind of discussion, you know, the uh, ESG discussion really evolved. And also uh, the reason I joined the UN as a special envoy to promote the uh, innovative finance and a sustainable investment to support the Secretary General's effort to achieve SDGs, sustainable development goal was, there is a widespread and a growing recognition that finance and asset management can and should play much bigger role to, uh, to make this world and also this capital market and uh, this economy and uh, this capitalism more sustainable and more inclusive. So uh, there's a lot of a conversion of the, uh, what the UN is trying to achieve and also the, what the investor is trying to achieve and also the, what the, uh, the corporate executive and a corporate board are trying to achieve. So I put in a title uh, as a, you know, ESG from the, uh, the concept to action because six years ago, I had to debate a lot about a concept because a lot of people believe that the uh, ESG is just a conceptual framework. So uh, at the GPIF, we tried uh, many things like trying to just approve that's actually investment uh, strategy or investment or portfolio management uh, tools by introducing a new ESG uh, themed indices, including gender diversity index and also the carbon efficiency index and et cetera. So they um, the took a step by step by actually introducing and implementing particular investment. And uh, GPAI had a very extensive discussion with the, uh, their asset manager to make sure when they pick the company to put in a GPF portfolio, uh, we ask them what can be the factors which probably wouldn't affect the uh, short-term performance of the business they are buying it for uh, on behalf of GPF, but what if any negative externality, which both affect negatively that company's long-term viability, as well as the uh, the uh, the environment, and uh, we need to bring in another concept at that time, the concept of universal ownership. Because where I grew up in this industry, and uh, basically all the financial theory and portfolio theory I learned uh, at the business school and the financial analyst education, and also OJT, is all about how to be better off than the rest of the market. So basically how to beat the market and uh, how to create the portfolio, which is better off uh, from uh, the rest of the market. It sounds like the, uh, the, you know, we can create the sanctuary or we can create totally segregated uh, portfolio from the, uh, the, the rest of the world, which at the time I was managing the GPF, the other fund, I con concluded that's not possible because when I look at the performance of the uh, asset owners long term, they are much more subject to the, what happened to the world rather than how they invested. So uh, I think it's important for the professional asset managers to compete, trying to be better than the uh, their competitors. But at the same time, we need to pay attention to to make that financial return. Is there any, you know, we also need to minimize negative externality of the activities, uh, you know, the, by the portfolio companies. And also the, uh, we should uh, work, investors should work with the, uh, the their government uh, to implement the, uh, the uh, guidance and rules uh, to promote sustainability. So this year, um, finally, that the, uh, the, all the G7 nations agree to achieve uh, 2050 net zero, and I really, uh, you know, the uh, pleased to see that the uh, the South, uh, the Korea is also uh, joining this bandwagon by committing net, uh, net zero by 2050, and uh, that's now become the root of the game. So uh, throughout my discussion with the at the GPIF, and even after that, uh, one of the biggest challenge for me to uh, you know get to that get the constructive discussion on ESG integration at the portfolio management level was they struggled to agree on the sort of base case scenario. So uh, I have a memory of asking the, uh, the big asset managers like uh, CEOs and also the, uh, the corporate CEOs uh, when we gather uh, in Rome, 
I asked them, do you think we should achieve net zero by 2050? And everybody raised their hand. After that, I followed up the question asking, do you think we can do that? We can achieve that. And again, everybody raised a hand. And after that, finally, I asked them a question, do you think we would achieve it? Very few people raised a hand. So I think that they are, they are base case scenario for their business planning and for portfolio management at that time was humanity will fail to achieve net zero. But now I think the, uh, that we have enough convincing evidence and the political will and also the uh, corporates are now, uh, you know, the um, uh, becoming vocal about the need for achieving that goal. So uh, this year, we think we will rewrite uh, our, you know, the business and investment base case scenario that, the, uh, that we achieve 2050 net zero. So just to, um, you know, the, uh, create the symbolic, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, movement. Uh, together with Michael Bloomberg and uh, Mark Carney, we are, you know, th we are three, the financial special envoy of the UN working on sustainable finance for climate change. Uh, we are trying to uh, set up the, uh, the uh, Glasgow Alliance, financial alliance or for net zero. So uh, we already started convened by the uh, UN Secretary General uh, Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, Net Zero Asset Manager Alliance, now Net Zero Asset, uh, the Bank Alliance, Net Zero Insurance Alliance. So we are trying to bring all those, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, alliance where the, uh, the financial players commit to 2050 net zero together at the uh, COP26 uh, in Glasgow to make a statement and uh, make a statement that we all together to work uh, in a scenario of achieving net zero. So I think the uh, the uh, I like to say like you know this year uh, we are going to uh, push this agenda for G20, G7, COP26. Sustainable finance is going to become the one of the biggest topic and. Uh, here today, uh, you're gathering to discuss the uh, ESG and particular from, particularly from the corporate governance perspective. I think like, uh, you know, that Kerry's uh, presentation said that very well. I totally agree. I cannot agree more uh, on some of her, her statements, like, uh, you know, the now company has to have a purpose. Of course, they need to provide the, uh, the financial return for the shareholders because otherwise they don't need to exist uh, in, a cap in a free capital market, uh, cap uh, capitalism. But uh, at the same time, uh, we are now asking the, the corporate to have a purpose to serve non-shareholder stakeholders. So uh, it is very important for the corporate governance not only to push the, uh, the corporate executive to deliver short-term performance, but also uh, well, actually, the, the usually uh, in other country, like particularly in the U.S., the CEO and executives are very naturally incentivized to deliver short-term performance because it's aligned with their uh, remuneration. So the board has specific role to make sure that the uh, corporate executive will pay attention to uh, the strategies, particularly on the sustainability and uh, human capital and all the societal issue, which probably wouldn't. Uh, impact their short-term financial performance, but also but affect their long-term sustainability of their business and to contribute to their long-term value creation. At the same time, again, uh, the new principle of the ICGN is very clear. Uh, without saving the, uh, the long-term sustainability of the environment or society, there's no business remain sustainable. So uh, I think the double bottom line and also the uh, double materiality Kerry mentioned was very powerful. I think that we need to pay attention to double materiality. It's no longer just a financial materiality because when I started the uh, my advocacy for ESG at the GPIF, most commonly asked the question was, uh, Mr. Mizuno, do you think ESGs are financially material? And uh, it was very, you know, the, uh, ch uh, the confusing question because one, it can be material for long term, but may not be for short term. So the long termism is one key, uh, you know, the inputs when you discuss that kind of materiality. And the second is, you know, the, the 
seems we seem to believe that there's only one materiality, but we should have another materiality, which is basically just serving for the other uh, the multi stakeholders, including uh, future generation stakeholders, because keeping the environment is actually serves for the equity with the uh, the future generation between future generation and the current generation. And also, I particularly like the uh, the concept of like dynamic materiality, because now I think the uh, it's became almost politically incorrect to uh, to uh, talk negatively about the ESG. So when you talk to the uh, somebody at the high uh, high level uh, position in our finance industry, every single person says ESG is critical. ESG is the center of their uh, business practice. So uh, I think at the conceptual level, nobody disagrees anymore. But when it comes to the, uh, the actual actions, uh, devils live in the details, and devils, devils, devils live in the actions. So, uh, and um, they are actually sometimes, you know, very, actually very often uses the lack of standard, uh, standardized matrix as a reason why they cannot take actions. I want to question people who make that statement or use the uh, use a lack of standard uh, uh, standardized information or ESG matrix as a reason they cannot take action. First, if you are working in the uh, the asset management industry or market making uh, the managing the fund, uh, this is a real opportunity once in a lifetime to create a difference. So uh, if the other uh, imp- uh, the data becomes standardized and available for everybody, you know, the market efficiency kicks in. So it makes, makes more difficult the asset manager's uh, job to uh, deliver extra return. And the second, well, you cannot wait for that. Uh, this year, the reason I, I serve on the UN, uh, you know, as a special envoy is I still believe in the, the power of the, um, the free market. So at the end of the day, market will figure out because we started seeing a lot of the other uh, examples that the, the company who are regarded as the uh, sort of like um, uh, make have a negative impact on environment, uh, their stock price is seems to be more uh, overweighted by that kind of long term negative sustainability impact than their, you know, very uh, strong cash flow as of today. So we started seeing like, a, you know, that the, the sort of a convergence of long-term perspective of the, or sustainability of the business and today's cash flow, but it's going to take a time for the free market to fix it. So uh, this year, there will be a lot of discussion on the uh, disc standardized disclosure uh, practice. So um, I think ICJ and Kerry uh, recommended strongly for any company. And also I wanted to uh, urge investors to disclose the carbon footprints of their own uh, or ESG, you know, their risk and risk, you know, opportunity factors of their own portfolio. Because when you ask the portfolio company to do something, investor, you should do your homework, right? So I have been, championing the uh, the, uh, the TCFD recommendation as the one of the most commonly uh, used climate uh, related risk and uh, opportunity disclosure. And uh, I hope that will remain uh, as the, uh, the core for the all the different ESG disclosure framework. So I strongly uh, suggest that the, uh, the Korean corporations and uh, also the Korean investors uh, sign up to TCFD recommendation and uh, start disclosing their analysis and a governance over climate risk and opportunities. That's probably the, the best first uh, ESG disclosure that you can take. And uh, there's a very, very uh, high probability that the uh, TCFD be- will become a core of the uh, all the different ESG or like a sustainability disclosure framework uh, getting uh, merged. And I think the uh, government UN have to play a role. And I'm glad to hear that the, uh, you know, Japanese FSA recently in their uh, new, uh, revised the, uh, the corporate governance court, they made it effectively mandatory for prime market, uh, the companies to do a TCFD disclosure. And, uh, I think the other uh, Korea may have a different framework, but the uh, you know it's actually helpful 
and the investor is getting ready that when they see some uh, disclosure on the climate risk and opportunities, they can uh, act intelligently uh, because there was a lot of like, uh, you know, skepticism on the uh, corporate CFO side, you know, it may affect their stock price if they disclose the risk. But I think the, again, that the, uh, this year, we see a lot of changes in the, the uh, investor attitude when actually, when they don't see the risk disclosure, they discount the company's stock uh, the valuation. So things are happening and uh, ICGN uh, principal corporate uh, governance uh, described a lot of what I have been uh, pushing. And uh, again, this movement is now become the uh, sort of like the universal uh, movement because one investor is getting ready, corporates are getting ready. And uh, I now serve on as a ex executive fellows or like a senior fellows of four major business school, Harvard Business School, Cambridge, Oxford, and Kellogg. All of them invited me on the basis they wanted to promote more sustainability or ESG agenda in their MBA education. I serve on the Future Finance Advisory Council of a CFA Institute where they wanted to uh, integrate more and more ESG sustainability uh, aspect of the, uh, the uh, financial analysis into their curriculum. So uh, I think this year we will start seeing everybody's moving in the same direction. And uh, I'm really encouraged that the, uh, the, you know, this Korean Corporate Governance Forum uh, you know, listening to the um, uh, opening remarks uh, before Kerry talks a lot about how to mainstream ESG and how to take an action. So thank you again for inviting me. Uh, I feel very honored to be a part of this discussion and uh, looking forward to joining the panel after this. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Nosang for a very interesting talk and thanks for highlighting the importance of uh, ESG disclosure. So uh, when we have a panel discussion shortly, we will spend more time discussing uh, ESG disclosure, uh, ratings and research and various methodology. So that was the, um, the two uh, keynote uh, speeches. And then uh, we would like to move on to uh, panel discussion uh, where um, uh, Ms. Nosang will continue to be here and join the panel discussion. And from Toronto, we have uh, Michael Jancy, who is uh, Chief Executive of uh, Sustainalytics, uh, which is the largest independent um, provider of ESG research and ratings. Um, Michael, do we have you? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank Good morning you. from Toronto. Very, very early in Toronto. Thanks for joining us. Um, do we have Joanna from um, um, London? Yes, here I am. Good okay. evening to you. Good morning. Um, she's the Group Chief Investment Officer at Schroeder's, and I think she's also in charge of the uh, multi-asset investment. Okay. And then uh, we would like to invite uh, Mr. Park Tae-yang, Busajang-nim, the Chief Investment Officer of KIC. <laughs> okay, so... Um, We'll have about 40 minutes for a panel discussion. I'm sure you have a lot of questions, but let me just kick off uh, just to, you know, we get warmed up. Um, I have um, two questions, one for um, Johanna, uh, who is the uh, group CIO at Schroeder. And the other question is for Pak uh, Teang Buzajang Nim, the uh, CIO at KI, uh, KIC. So, uh, Johanna, I understand you also uh, sit on the board, investment board of Cambridge University. Is that right? Yes, I do. Okay. I know you graduated from Oxford, where you served for uh, Cambridge. That's interesting. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, yes, it's a long story. I'm their diversity candidate. Okay. So whether um, at Schroeder's or at um, Cambridge University, could you share with us how you integrate ESG into your investment process? Do you find it more effective in enhancing the return, managing the risk, or is it the combination of both? Or uh, the second question I have is, do you use uh, negative screening in your investment process? Sure. Um, I think the first point about um, thinking about return, obviously our priority first is we need to deliver return for our clients. But as was mentioned earlier, the traditional model of capitalism has always had a flaw in the form of negative externalities, which occur when production or consumption um, ha has imposed costs on, it, on third parties, which are not compensated for. So essentially social costs exceed private costs. That's always been a flaw in capitalism. And as long-term investors, we've always had to take into account um, an understanding of the broader impact on society of a company's operations. That's always been a, a significant part of what we do to the points that were made earlier as long-term investors understanding the sustainability of the profits. However, I would say there is a renewed sense of urgency on this front, um, and it's given the challenges of climate change, which are obvious, also agreeing with the point that was made earlier that the pandemic accelerated this focus on sort of human-centered capitalism. And we believe that because these ESG factors are now being considered much more significantly by our investors and by our governments, we do expect it to, these factors to drive um, the investment environment we operate in a lot more. So they're increasingly important in our assessment of the company. And again, agreeing with the point that Mizuno-san made earlier, for us, this is a huge opportunity. So we don't see a tension between return and an incorporation of ESG factors. Because actually we believe as these factors matter more, they will drive the investment environment in which we operate. And also, as Mizuno-san was indicating, it gives us an opportunity to benefit from our in-house analysis. So we developed our own tools uh, a number of years ago to basically allow us to measure the impact of these negative externalities on corporate earnings. So in some sense, we view this as a source of edge for us in delivering better returns for our clients. So I hope that answers your first question. How about, um, do you use a negative screening in your ESG uh, approach? So we have, um, generally that is not our preference. Our preference is to really consider the broadest range of opportunities and really try and engage with companies and try and identify potentially underpriced transition. Um, so our philosophy is not to rely on negative screenings, but actually to rely on much greater engagement with companies and analyzing those risks. Having said that, there are some exclusions that we have included, particularly in our uh, funds, which are focused on sustainability, like coal, like tobacco. Okay. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, Johanna, so my second question, and then I'm going to open the question for the floor, um, is for uh, Mr. Park Tae-yang, Buzajang-nim. Uh, I will switch on to the Korean. <laughs> Buzajang-nim, yeah. So I believe the KIC is also the one of the companies investing the more than 60 the securities companies so in different regions and the areas across the world when it comes to investment into the ESG what are your methodologies for the companies and clients for your assessment procedures and Myers the next question is that in relation to approaches is there any standardized processes or any integrated standards for ESG investment this question goes to David Park on behalf of the KIC, Korea Investment Corporation, so for the more than 70 security stocks and the more than the 360 traditional as well as alternative assets are the, our major practice. In terms of the traditional assets and the, the portfolios adjustment as well as the management are also reflected in the ESG assessment. And on the other hand, in terms of the alternative assets, 
the individual investment portfolios and the processes are also evaluated. But in addition for the sustainability and ISS and all other the global ESG, the rating agencies, I don't really think that these criteria and standards are um, su sufficient in my perspective. Therefore, we also need to have the more clear standards. In addition, for the private markets, alternative assets, I believe that the such evaluation criteria should be also fully accessed because as the criteria have not been fully accessed so far. So this, this is also my priority for the KIC. When it comes to ESG assessment for investing companies, we are taking the two progress, the processes. First is that at least the two global companies are the ones that we refer to the assessment of the ESG from the overseas companies. In addition to the result of the overseas companies, we also have the task force and in-house team for the thorough analysis and the reviews on the ESG assessment for at least two overseas companies. In addition, we also still ongoing and the strengthening to really find out the differences and to discover any criteria and standards that we have to be more fully and the more covered and more adopted fully in the future. Moreover, as you're well aware, the climate and, and also the ratio of the female directors and the board are also combined factors that we have to consider for our ESG assessment. Therefore, for the ESG assessment and criteria, we also need to also focus on the, those priorities, such as the neutralization, as well as related processes as part of our process criteria. And the second point is I'd like to also highlight that Based on the coordinations and the collaborations with other investing companies, we are also trying to collect the more involved and related information. For example, on, on behalf of the KIC, definitely we are taking and conference calls and any other the collaborations with other investing companies for us to really make sure that we are on the right track. And such a detailed information are not really being capable of our own the processes. Therefore, we also need more collaborations and, co um, and cooperations with other investing companies as well. In this regard, by reflecting such reality, but ESG still, as ESG is still facing some of the limitations and may also impact on the further investment in the future. Therefore, we are also working on the project by analyzing the specific the factors by regions and areas. And in doing so, risk assessment and valuations are also the, the ones that we also have conducted for our processes. Therefore, we can also make decisions on the execution of the investment. For our company, for efficient and the stable and the safe the utilizations of the investment, are the ones that we are sort of lot, um, taking care of the dealing with the civil complaints in the the areas as well, such the handling those the potential hazard as well as the harm factors, and we also need to make sure that we review the thorough processes by reflecting the circumstances and conditions in different regions. In doing so, we also like to also try to the, get the information as indirect as possible from other investing companies and the for the other global the sovereign wealth fund companies and other investors we are so striving to listen to their ideas and exchange our ideas as much as possible so that we can also reflect more ideas as much as possible for our investment decision making processes and i'll or said the more comments for the standardizations on the esg assessment for example, the IFRS, as the global foundation of the reporting and the accounting standards, the sustainability, as well as the disclosure of the result have also been reflected, and the accounting standard, the board, as well as audit comments, and the related, the big five, the standards are also ongoing for, as a main topic for the ongoing processes and the conversations.
And in terms of the standardization of the disclosure of the, the board directors and the vote and voting results are the ones that we also need to reflect those related ideas as much as possible for our future progresses. But the ESG, the standardized the disclosure of the ESG results would be also very challenging to be fully covered in the future. On the perspective of the investors, the ESG assessment should be more clearly announced and also the third really reflected for them to really clear assess those priorities. But ESG, for example, should not be regarded as just one of the general concepts for the companies so that for even though we have the same access or the same information of the ESG, still we may also have the different ideas and different comments from a lot of the different companies. Therefore, once you also have the standardized criteria on the ESG evaluation or assessment, therefore unified and integrated the standard standardized on the ESG, ESG should be also fully covered and applied to do so. Therefore, for institutional investors, not only just for the the disclosure on the voting result, but also for their the capacity buildings for announcing and disclosing all the related results and the processes should be also reflect and deal with the proactive strategies and their future progresses for the company's perspective. Do you have anything you want to add from your perspective? Well, thank you. Uh, and my uh, thanks to the, and congratulations to the conference organizers. It's uh, my pleasure to be here with you and certainly feel very honored to be uh, on this panel this afternoon. I expect that, that uh, the comments that uh, I'll just make briefly have been covered through the uh, heroes and carries uh, presentations and already what I've uh, heard from Johanna and so on. But I do, I do congratulate you for embracing the broader concepts of sustainability and ESG as part of a corporate governance discussion because the alignment between a corporation's interests and an investor's interests in long-term uh, value creation in a sustainable way uh, is becoming a more powerful force everywhere uh, that we look around the globe. And for investors, especially those that have a long-term focus, like Johanna was saying, or pension plans uh, broadly, uh, environmental social issues are now viewed very clearly as risks that both investors and companies need to account for as part of their investment decision-making process. And uh, that is happening in all parts of the world. Um, I know that uh, for some uh, view it still as a phenomena that is largely uh, um, uh, with prominence in Europe. And while that uh, remains uh, a very robust market for sustainable investing in ESG, I can assure you that uh, investors of all types, asset owners, large investment managers that serve um, pension plans and sovereign wealth funds, and increasingly retail and wealth individual investors uh, are embracing this concept in other parts of the world, including in North America, most interestingly, and I think most importantly in the United States, which of course is the largest capital markets in the world, and as you well know, across Asia uh, more broadly. I'm, much of this has initially, I think, been driven by risk analysis, which has uh, already been covered, but I do wanna highlight, I think, one very important trend uh, in, in our space. And in fact, I don't, very often use the terms ESG or sustainable investing or responsible investment anymore. I tend to use the words or terms sustainable finance because I think we are seeing a very vibrant um, ecosystem emerge where the, uh, there's an alignment of objectives more broadly between investors and corporations as they look at sustainability risks and I think in large part, that's driven by regulatory tailwinds that you've no doubt talked about, the Paris Agreement, 
and so on. But I also believe it's driven increasingly by something that I believe Kerry touched on, and that is the systemic risks that some sustainability issues present to investors and companies, whether those are climate change, inequality, human rights issues, biodiversity. These are things that be, uh, go beyond an investor's ability to evaluate or manage on an individual security level. I think they're also largely encompassed in the sustainable development goals, which of course Hero talked about, and uh, the fact that both companies and investors are embracing the SDGs, not just because it's the right thing to do or because they have strong positive impacts more broadly, but because they encompass and define systemic risks that investors and corporations have to be aware of. But increasingly, I think the exciting part of what we're seeing here is that companies understand that they need to transition business models to help address collectively these systemic risks. And they're seeing increasing opportunity to raise capital in a way uh, that embraces sustainability. So you're seeing an emergence of what I call a very exciting new asset classes, green, social and sustainability bonds, sustainability link loans. We are seeing tremendous creativity in the capital markets that is embracing the opportunity that's associated with sustainability. And at the same time, as companies are looking to raise capital to transform and to shift business models, in a way which isn't aligned with a, a lower carbon economy and so on, you are seeing an increasing uh, appetite from investors to allocate assets uh, in a way that is looking to fund those business models. And again, so you see a very aligned uh, symbiotic relationship between companies, between investors who are both now focused on the risk and opportunity sides of sustainability and when you have investors and companies focusing on these issues in a powerful way, it means that the intermediaries across the capital markets that serve those two powerful pillars are also turning their attention to sustainability. So you're seeing a virtuous circle. You are seeing a very powerful sustainable finance ecosystem, which is now focusing on both the risk and opportunity side of sustainability globally. And so I think that uh, it, it's a perfect conversation to have for the Korean corporate governance uh, perspective, uh, and you're seeing a broadening now across uh, a range of issues. So I'll leave my comments there and look forward to questions from uh, the participants. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Michael. I mean, we have um, uh, many professionals, uh, senior executive from uh, financial sector, but also we have uh, uh, many uh, executive also um, managers from the uh, listed Korean companies, but also uh, lawyers and other professionals uh, here. So um, why don't we open up the floor for a question? So it's time to receive any questions from the audience floor. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand. So the one of the staff member may deliver the microphone. And then before and before making the question, please identify yourself as well as your affiliation or company. Okay. And also please make sure that specify the person that you're asking the question to. Okay. by high cost of capital and high cost of debt. Also, there could be stock price crash risk for bad boys. I get it. But evidence on the effect of good acts on profits and growth is at best elusive. So can you tell me how you use ESG scores in assessing profits and growth? That's my first question. So, Dr. Lee, do you have anyone from the panel who want to answer your question? Oh, it's a generic question. Uh, and if, I, if you may, uh, I'll add my second question. Is um, that okay? No, first, let's uh, finish the first question. Do we have anyone from the panel who want to answer? If not very clear, you could ask Dr. Yeah. Lee again. 
Um, Joanna, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. I'm happy to answer that since it's one of the things we have to think about all day long. Um, I think that there's one direct way in which these factors can directly impact profits, and that's through government regulation to crystallize essentially these negative externalities. So we're seeing evidence of that on, on environmental factors, for example. So it's basically, if you want to think about it through the lens of profits, it's a regulatory risk that you need to take into account. Um, so that's one way in which you get a very direct impact. I think longer term, it's really about, I guess, as money's being moved in this direction, and I think this was something that just came up right now, is that, you know, I totally agree with Michael on this, that there's an opportunity here. There is this very vibrant um, sustainable finance ecosystem. I'm going to nick that line now, Michael. Um, where basically, because uh, policy's moving in that direction, money's moving in that direction, there's a lot of money to be made in helping to finance um, the building of the infrastructure required for the Green New Deal. So, so those are two very tangible ways in which we see a direct impact of these factors on our profit expectations. Okay, um, Dr. Lee, can we come back to you after we give an opportunity for others to ask questions? 다른 분들 질문 있으시면 해주실 수 있겠어요? Yep. So the floor is open. So if you have any question, please raise your hand. The gentleman in the middle of uh, the lady. Um, um, you know, Namu mentioned uh, in the beginning of the, the conference that, um, you know, I got uh, elected as the uh, non-executive director of, um, of a, a listed company, Hankook Tire. So as the, the, uh, their first female director. So um, that was thanks to the, uh, the newly introduced uh, legal requirement, uh, which was you know, initiated and supported by the leaders in this forum today. So, um, and this is the, you know, like a great start uh, towards the, uh, the diversity of the, the boards of the Korean companies. So uh, gender diversity. Um, so my question uh, is, you know, to anyone in the in the panel. Um, so I am like, you know, thinking forward about uh, further uh, diversity uh, of the of the board. So, uh, for example, um, you know, uh, we we um, like I saw uh, in other global companies that. Uh, executives of other companies, you know, join the board um, uh, of, you know, like other, other companies. So, for example, you know, <laughs> Namu mentioned uh, Johanna uh, coming from Oxford and, you know, you work for Cambridge. So, um, but in Korea, uh, like it may, uh, we, don't, we don't see many cases that you know, current executives uh, joining the board of other companies. So uh, I want to ask the, the panels that, you know, what uh, benefits do you see in such practices? And then um, any, any advices from you about uh, promoting those cases uh, like in the, in the Korean uh, corporate world? So I think your question was, let's say, a current or former executive CEO of Samsung joining the board of Hyundai Motor or LG or vice versa, something like that, right? Do we have anyone uh, from the panel who wanna? Did you know Sang, do you wanna share some perspective from uh, Japan? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, you know, the Japan Japanese government trying to promote the, um, the board diversity uh, by revi continuously revising corporate governance code and stewardship code. I always try to uh, send this message to the people who are still struggling with the concept of like, a, you know, the corporate governance or the diversity on the board. First of all, if the business continue to be involved in uh, global businesses, you wanted to have the, uh, the board which represent a different uh, interest and a different preference, a different culture, and also the other uh, gender diversity is one key factors. And I always 
trying to persuade the Japanese government, uh, Japanese corporations, the Korean corporations, because in Korea, in Japan, it's much more difficult to have a racial diversity. So uh, let's start with gender diversity. That's the, the one you can just make a change immediately. And uh, also, uh, if you cannot the, uh, bring the other uh, uh, more female on the board, it's much harder to bring foreign uh, you know, the board representative on the, on the corporate board. So uh, I think it's all about diversity, having the people from, you know, the, the, uh, your competitor, that's again the diversity. So uh, if you have more diversity on the board, that's create a sort of diversification effect on the decision making. May I? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, may I just echo some of those comments? And, and by the way, congratulations in regards to your appointment to the board, uh, because I, I mean, diversity uh, in most things uh, is a strength, including on a board of directors, and there's many forms of diversity. And our clients would generally express the thought that diversity of perspective and experience is exceedingly important, and especially as, as, as Hero stated, uh, for global companies. But I will also suggest that diversity increasingly is going to mean a board that has the experience and the capacity to both understand the sustainability risks that the company faces over time and the opportunities that it may have um, uh, through the changes that we are undoubtedly going to see uh, over the next years, whether it's driven by the regulatory changes that Johanna mentioned uh, or, or other opportunities. And, and we are starting to see that uh, uh, in the United States, as I'm sure you're aware, the recent um, uh, annual general meeting and, and board changes at Exxon Corporation, uh, which took a dramatic sort of turn with um, shareholders placing three of four candidates on a board that have uh, deep climate change uh, experience because Exxon has been generally not open um, to say the least in regards to bringing a diversity of opinion and experience on the board on a topic that uh, one can probably agree is key to their success over the long term. Uh, you see, in fact, um, our colleague on the panel, Hero, um, uh, his uh, placement on, on boards too, for many reasons, but uh, no doubt one of those is the fact that he has a long experience and expertise and understanding of sustainability risks and opportunities. And so we're starting to see this diversity of perspectives um, on gender and otherwise. And I, I like other panels, uh, encourage uh, this trend in Korea and, and other markets around the world as our clients are, are already doing. If I may, can I just say one thing quickly? Please. Um, yeah, I mean, I think one thing I wanted to say, a couple of things. First of all, I do agree with your idea of bringing in people from other industries onto your board. So if I take the example of the board we have at Schroeder's, members of our board have worked in the pharmaceutical industry, Amazon, um, aerospace. So the point is that we really believe in the benefit of different perspectives, and that sometimes requires expertise from other industries. Um, so that's number one. Number two, I think my top tip for creating a more diverse environment is ultimately creating a more inclusive culture. Diversity is a natural consequence of more inclusion. And to create an inclusive culture, what you have to do is actually raise professional standards of behavior. If you raise professional standards of behavior, people typically will feel more comfortable, people from different backgrounds, and you will end up with a more diverse environment. People sometimes think that to create diversity, you have to lower standards. I think you have to raise standards. Um, so I think that, and that's what we've experienced at Schroeder's as we've increased the diversity of all our committees. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. I'm very proud to say in this room, we have very large number of females, so we're making some good progress. I think we have time for just one question. Uh, gentlemen from behind. Uh, hello, uh, this is um, James Lim from Dalton Investments. Um, 
So uh, Korea is known to have, um, you know, valuation discount as called as uh, Korea discount for a long time. So I wanted to ask each of you, um, why do you think uh, the valuation discount exists, um, you know, more for uh, specific reasons? I know that, it, you know, it's corporate governance and whatnot, but, you know, really uh, one or two things that you think, and, and some, you know, some of that can be kind of illogical reasons like, you know, flows and um, others. So if you can just comment on one or two things that you think is really driving the valuation discount, then one or two things you would actually recommend or see uh, to, you know, to actually witness the change. I mean, what do you want to see uh, to remedy that discount? And um, I have in also in line, um, Along that question, I have a um, more specific question to Mr. Uh, Mizuno because uh, we've um, seen a lot of, you know, corporate governance improvement um, initiatives in Japan. And um, I think you could probably provide um, your views on, you know, what has worked and what hasn't. And, uh, you know, you can probably give us some lessons um, to uh, Korean market. Okay, thank you very much. Um... Who would like to uh, answer the question about the Korea discount or general corporate governance issue in Korea? Yeah. Uh, I'm happy to give a, a quick comment on that. I think that it is a governance issue uh, which results in that discount to some extent. And I think this is therefore a tangible example of how improving governance can result in better outcomes for the financial performance of companies. So I think that that is certainly the case. Um, I think that, but from a sectoral perspective, I think Korea is a great market. I mean, you know, you do have companies that are world champions in what they do. And so for us, it's a market that, you know, is really at the heart of what we do. Um, so I guess I would say that the way I describe it is actually the US tends to be at a premium to all other markets. You know, the UK is trading at a discount too. So maybe don't take it too personally because we have the same problem here. <laughs> Okay, um, Ms. Nozang, do you want to yeah, answer? Please. Yeah, sure. Um, so, um, yeah, Korean discounts, yeah, Japan has discount too. So, uh, well, each market has their own challenges. But the, to answer uh, the, your question, that um, uh, what the other uh, Korea could learn from Japan, if there's any, uh, well, first of all, uh, you know, this, uh, the, uh, the uh, Japanese government are uh, very hard to push on a corporate governance or stewardship uh, responsibility of investors. Uh, they actually try to uh, the copy what the, uh, the UK did. So Japan is the, uh, the first country outside of like Commonwealth who implemented the uh, stewardship and a corporate governance code. Uh, the, so I think the, uh, having that kind of like a, a already internationally proven framework uh, it can give a very good foundation. The reason I push ESG and SDGs hard to Japanese corporate to use that as a framework is uh, just to be, you know, very candid. I mean, I don't think the Japanese and Korean has been very successful in creating a framework uh, to put their strategy in it. So, uh, it's actually very convenient to uh, use the ESG or SDGs framework uh, or stewardship code corporate governance framework, which has been developed by the other countries, but seems to be working well. So that's the one um, thing that the uh, Korean could also the uh, the, uh, the follow Japanese uh, pursuit. And the things that the, uh, the you should be careful is you know, the, again, that the uh, the corporate governance is just basically like, uh, you know, the concept developed uh, in uh, uh, in America or like a UK or Western world where they have reason why they had to come up with that kind of corporate governance, the philosophy. Uh, and um, some of those things, like uh, when I started my advocacy for ESG, particularly some social agenda, Japanese companies did it as a to kind of like, a, you know, they have been doing it but the US and the UK started paying more attention to those factors. And uh, sometimes I observed the, uh, the tight corporate governance resulted in 
pushing the executive back to pursue long-term sustainability. So that's why I put in my title, the other uh, corporate governance with the purpose. So uh, we should, you know, um, that's uh, one thing that Japan is now struggling. It's becoming more and more sort of tick box exercises. So uh, Korea should have uh, the, uh, their own culture and uh, the uh, positive aspect of the way you run the business. So uh, interpret the, uh, the, those kind of the corporate governance principle well uh, to work, uh, to promote those, the, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the corporate purpose and, uh, you know, the end of for the, uh, uh, societal benefit like SDGs. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Ms. no -san. I think, uh, we'll have to leave it there. I know it's already 7 PM <laughs> and you must be very, uh, hungry. So I'd like to, I would like to thank uh, Michael, particularly, uh, what time is it in Toronto? I it's early. It's uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's almost six a.m. Okay, I really appreciate um, Johanna from London, Mizuno Sang from Tokyo, uh, Park Buso Sangnim from Seoul. So uh, we'll uh, leave there and thank you very much for uh, listening to our panel discussion. 감사합니다. Thank you for thank you thank you for your attending. Thank you. Okay, so we have also done for all the main events and the sessions and really hope that all the information will be also helpful for your work and the future, your future. 